At this year's ASH meeting, uh, the decision trial was updated. Elias, could you comment on that for well, us? Well, yes, we're seeing at ASH the final result, the five years update of the decision, and unfortunately the study will be closed, there will be no follow-up. We won't be able to hear anything after that. So the decision is a randomized trial uh, comparing imatinib standard of care versus dazatinib 100 mg once daily in patients with early chronic phase. The primary endpoint of the study was the achievement of a confirmed TCYR uh, within 12 months, secondary endpoint MMR, and then EFS transformation, survival, and safety. Clearly, the primary endpoint, secondary endpoint were both met at 12 months, and then we have been seeing the follow-up of the trial where the superiority was maintained uh, throughout the time with deeper responses, faster responses, MMR, MR4, 4.5, complete molecular emission, all are great. We have less transformation. So far, we don't see a survival benefit. And that is, again, bring us back to case zero. Well, can I start imatinib and switch to zetib later on? That is still debatable and will remain for the next years. Uh, definitely, the ZATIP is superior across all the board, whether somebody with low risk or high risk disease. Interestingly, uh, in the trial, uh, yeah, treatments were well tolerated. As I said, the pleurofusion were grade one and two, but still we do see discontinuation rate high due to side effect. And that is in the setting of clinical trials. It means in real life, uh, somebody will wake up with nightmare, all right, side effects, stop the drug. So we really need to keep close eye on side effect, optimize supportive care, really to keep a good adherence to the treatment so we can optimize the long-term outcome. But definitely these are good options uh, for the frontline therapy. So you bring up a great point, and that's how to mitigate side effects and how to assess for them. Uh, in, if I may, in, in, in my opinion, um, I think this is especially an, an especially important topic because um, we know, for instance, about the importance of adherence, certainly with imatinib, and, and its impact on long-term uh, outcomes. And um, one reason, not the only reason, but one reason why some patients perhaps are not adherent is because of you know, some grade two nausea or fatigue or, or what have you. Um, and um, so I'm actually very aggressive myself when it comes to, like, like Stu, when it comes to asking patients about what their quality of life is like. Um, and um, with some drugs, with dasatinib for instance, um, I, I'm pretty aggressive with dose reductions once patients have achieved various levels of remission. So if someone's on 100 milligrams of starting dose and has a deep response, but they're having you know, some fatigue issues, the first thing I'll wanna do is a brief interruption two weeks maybe and see if the side effect goes away. And if it does, it's most likely dasatinib related. Um, um, and then, I'll, it, and then I'll, what I'll do is typically drop them down to 50 milligrams. And for the most part, they maintain their molecular response you know, and do so you know, even, if, even if, if I go down, in, in, with the case of that drug, to 20 milligrams. There's also the hidden, uh, not so hidden, but the, 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 the other benefit of substantial cost savings. That's not the reason I do it, but 20 milligrams of dasatinib is, is far cheaper than, than even 400 milligrams of imatinib right now. Um, now, you can't necessarily do this with all drugs, and I'm not suggesting that people start with 400 milligrams and go down to 100 milligrams. So this is, this is an important point that, you know, but this is, this is just some of the, the art of, of, of practice that, you know, that, 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 that I apply. I don't know, I don't know if, what, what other people do in, in that particular uh, context with other drugs. I think you have the ability and to continue to follow those patients exceedingly closely, their molecular studies, and ensure that they maintain the degree of response that you would like to see. But I too, um, if patients are experiencing any toxicities, will frequently offer a dose interruption and then decreasing the dose. Sometimes if there is exquisite tolerance, considering a dose increase. And the medications that I've done that most commonly with um, are dasatinib and bosutinib. You know, you mentioned bosutinib, and we want to discuss about it essentially. When you prescribe the drug, the drug doesn't inhibit CK nor PGFR. It's a double start VCR inhibitor. We don't see pleural effusion nor, I mean, we do see myelosuppression, but the lower extent than what right. you see with other TKIs. But 80% will have diarrhea the first few days. And then it's amazing by starting at 400 milligrams per day and going up to 500 down the road, you will really help a lot of patients. Uh, by having those that sketch within a month period of time, it reduced significantly the diarrhea. Well, and if you have the diarrhea, usually I would keep them on a drug, I would educate them about them, I give Imodium, 
and then in the vast majority will be able to keep them at the same dose. But the second gen TK gave us a lot of flexibility of dose reduction compared to imatinib. You can go to 200 milligram of nilotinib, 20 milligram of dazatinib, buzotinib 400 and 300 milligram, and ponatinib 15 milligram. So. Uh, the high potency of the drugs give us more flexibility in addressing the yeah, dose. And, and, and pardon me, I just want to reiterate that doses below 300 milligrams of imatinib are not believed to be effective. And so nobody should, should be doing that unless it's under a special circumstance like the patient's on a very strong CYP3A4 inhibitor. That's a great point. I, I think we know, no, we can't minimize this whole idea of asking the patients about side effects. We surveyed our own patients. We found I found, to my surprise and not so happiness, um, that 25% of my patients told me they had not taken all of their pills during the prior month. So patients are, you know, if they don't feel well, they'll miss a dose here, miss a dose there, and that may come back to bite some of the patients. So I think you have to really push this, and if they're, they're not taking their medicines, find out why. Is it cost? They can't afford it. Get the social service people in there. If they're having side effects and they're, they're playing with their medicines and not telling us, it could end up hurting us and hurt, hurting the patients in the future. Yeah, it, it, it seems that you don't need to miss a lot of doses for it to have a potential impact um, outside of the setting of people already the deep response. So Neil said something very important. He said, you know, when my patients have a really deep response and they're doing well and they have a chronic problem, I'm pretty aggressive at adjusting their dose to see if we can get that better. Um, you know, patients, before they get to that deep response, um, even missing 10% uh, of your doses in a given month uh, may impact uh, puts people in a group that are less likely to have as good of a response as if they don't um, hit those, um, take the full 100% of the dosing. So I think that we need to keep in uh, mind it's very important to bug your patients and ask them aggressively, hey, are you missing work? Are you having trouble getting out of bed? Or are there are things you skipped doing this last month because of you weren't feeling well enough from your medicines to really get the idea of, of how well they're doing with it and if they're really taking it.